Welcome everybody to today's edition of the Conversations on Food Justice series. My name is Elliot Gaskin, Senior Vice President and Acting Chief Revenue Officer at Share Our Strength. I wanna first start by thanking our colleagues and partners at Food and Society at the Aspen Institute for partnering with us on this program. And especially thanks to Corby Kummer, Executive Director of Food and Society and Mary Carrillo. I also want to thank all of my terrific colleagues at Share Our Strength, but especially Julie McNulty and Faith Adula for all of their work in helping make this series so special. I want to also remind everybody that toward the end of the program, we will leave a few minutes for questions. So please feel free throughout the program to put any questions you have in chat, and the panelists will do their best to answer as many as we can uh, toward the end of today's program. 2023 brought an historic and unprecedented number of natural disasters. With 28 separate billion dollar disasters occurring in communities all across this country. While much attention is paid to the immediate aftermath of a disaster, the road to recovery is long, particularly for communities already facing social, economic, and political barriers to equity. We are eager to hear from today's panelists who are working in the face of these disasters to build equitable, sustainable, and resilient communities. I am so pleased with the great group of terrific panelists that we have. And first, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Richard Kumo, who is the Chief Program Officer at Hunger Free Oklahoma and a 2023 Food Leaders Fellow. Welcome, Richard. I'm very excited to introduce you to my amazing colleague, Rhonda Jackson at Share Our Strength, who is the director of our No Kid Hungry Louisiana program. Rhonda. Mary Jo Laborde, who is the executive director and CEO of Banco de Alimento de Puerto Rico. Welcome, Mary. And last but not least, the amazing Dr. Vanessa Robinson. Assistant Professor and Co-Investigator Delta Green's Food is Medicine Project at Tufts University School of Medicine. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you all in attendance for listening. I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, I wanna start us off today. I'm starting our conversation with a question for each of the panelists that'll just help us give some context with your experience um, to, to sort of frame our conversation. So I'm interested what brought you to this work um, and what experience has most shaped your thinking when it comes to food justice and disaster response? So I'm going to kick it off by starting with Dr. Robinson. Uh, first, before I uh, begin, I just wanted to uh, thank you all at the Aspen uh, Institute for having me. Uh, it is a delight, and I am uh, so excited to see what we discuss today. Um, in answer to your question, Richard, uh, that's a very a uh, complex question only because it depends on what point in my life did I decide about this food justice work. Um, I entered into the public health field at the age of 19. Uh, this was during a time where health equity per se was not at the forefront on a lot of public health issues. And so I really started off in health disparities work. Uh, and so I just basically always led from a place of compassion uh, and then I just move, put one foot in front of the other and, and move from there. But in terms of me arriving at Tufts, uh, it was at the height of the uh, George Floyd um, occurrence uh, that took place worldwide. We all saw that. Uh, and so I basically started to do work uh, with Tufts remotely while I was still in Houston, Texas. And I really got involved in health equity work and I started working with Tufts in terms of building up their maternal health equity portfolio uh, through Mother Lab and also through the Center for Black Maternal Health and Reproductive Justice. And it was at that point where I really got to understand uh, how to look at infrastructures, how to look at programs, how to look at organizations and develop a sharp eye for looking and seeing where health equity was missing and then where it could be replaced uh, with new innovative ways of actually providing uh, services, not to just say that we are providing services, but services that are in alignment with uh, those for which the programs were designed for. And so from then, uh, I guess my work was very impressive. 
Uh, and so uh, it hit wind to um, Dr. Chris Economos, who reached out to me uh, and told me about the Delta Greens project. And as soon as she said health equity, I said, sign me up. I had no idea that it was in Mississippi. Uh, the reason why I wanted to mention that is because I'm a native Mississippian, a proud uh, Magnolia girl from the South. You probably can't hear it in my speech until I get really, really excited and then you'll hear the Southern draw. Um, but on that project, I have really just sort of continued to refine my eye for looking to see how politics, how social structure plays a part in health inequity. And I always tell my uh, colleagues and my students that my overall research agenda is to look at matters of systemic exploitation, systemic racism, and then replace that with systemic equity. And I have been having a ball since. So in short, that is how I got uh, involved in not just maternal equity, but food equity as well. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. That's uh, very helpful. And I think good to sort of paint the picture of it's not one thing in time. It's sort of a buildup of many things that have led you to the place you are. And I, I bet you that's a theme we'll, we'll probably hear throughout the day. So. I want to kick it over to Rhonda Jackson next to tell us just a little bit um, about what brought you to this work and sort of that, that one experience that sort of is formative for you in food justice and disaster response. Rhonda, I think you're on mute still. Ah, there I am. <laughs> Sorry. So to me, that's actually two separate reasons, right? I came to disaster response because I am from New Orleans. I'm born and raised, as we say, um, and was living here during Hurricane Katrina, evacuated, lived away for almost two years, came back and did Gulf Coast program work um, around Katrina and housing policies. And so, you know, it was a federal response. It was a state response. It was a local response. But I worked heavily with federal. Um, and one of the things about policy change, especially federal, is that it's very slow, slow moving. Um, and so, you know, you win, but you never know from day to day how things are going. Um, but it takes it takes a while. And at the time, I think what I wanted to know mostly was to know when we would win, when we were winning. And so that's how I got to share our strength. Share our strength was doing work that was measurable, that was deliverable. Um, it was feeding kids. We could count the number of kids we were providing meals to at the time, those kinds of things. And so for me, it was about being able to set clear benchmarks and know when we were meeting them. Um, and so that's how I got into um, food justice and food access work. And then over time, of course, I always end up back at policy. And so, you know, whether it's summer EBT or other other pieces of the work, it is also around the policy and the policy needs because the programming work and those things should inform the policy because that's how you identify what's needed and not the other way around. I think a lot of times we do policy work first and just kind of you know, hope it works out for the folks who's actually being impacted by it. Um, but I'm a strong believer that people know what they need, they know what they want, and they know what works best for them in their situations. And every situation is different, whether it's Native Americans, rural Americans, uh, Black folks, or, you know, Latinos, and everybody. We know, folks know what they need, they just don't have the access to it. And so what I hope to do is try to bring access. That is so important. And I don't think I've ever resonated with a statement uh, more than uh, federal policy is slow moving because I feel <laughs> that deep in my bones. And, and that's a, always a, a challenging balance of wanting to see action now and knowing that it all comes back to policy. So thank you so much, Rhonda. All right, Mary Jo, I'm going to pass it to you. Hi, my name. Again, thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's a very, very Varied group of speakers today. I'm really happy about that. So thank you for having me. I come from a completely different, I, I came into this world through a completely different route. Um, I've been in corporate America and in management, strategic planning and all that for years, you know, decades, my whole career. Um, but then Maria hit Puerto Rico and it changed everyone's lives. And I then started getting involved in the nonprofit world. Um, and one day I heard about the Puerto Rico Food Bank and I came to do volunteer work and I fell in love with the work. Um, and and it's, it's 
the kind of work that we do here at the food bank, it's it's not very well known. And given the situation Puerto Rico was in and the five years of continuous disasters that we lived through, it kind of changes your life and it, it made me really rethink what I wanted to do for the rest of my career and what what best how best to use the resources and the knowledge that I have. Um, yes, the federal system is slow. But the one thing that I learned with the latest Hurricane Fiona, like, like we said, we've had five years of natural disasters nonstop, is that, and Maria taught us all, you cannot wait, you have to start by helping yourself. And things that we learned is that federal assistance will come, but it's designed so that the communities will begin the support by themselves first. That initial first response has to come from within. And that's something that very few people know about or are ready for. We were certainly not. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Joe. And I'm, 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 I want to stay with you because you mentioned hurricanes Irma and Maria, and that that's sort of what pushed you into this. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll remind people that uh, hurricanes Irma and Maria were in 2017, I believe. Um, yes. And they were one of the largest and most complicated uh, recovery efforts. They led to one of the largest and most complicated recovery efforts we've sort of ever seen in America. And that's not done. Y'all are still doing that work. Um, so I'm just interested. What challenges are you still grappling with um, from those hurricanes and from the, the, the natural disasters that have happened since? And how does that affect food insecurity um, in your work in, in the food security space? Um. I would I think that the two biggest issues that we're still leading uh, uh, working on are logistics and infrastructure. Maria hit the one area of our infrastructure that no hurricane had ever touched, and I don't think many natural dis at least hurricanes across the nation have impacted communications like Maria did. So the infrastructure of communications power grid, et cetera. Every time you try to rebuild it, something else happening comes back down. So this continuous change of natural disaster has not allowed us to fully recover and establish a solid sound infrastructure to mitigate future disasters. Um, part of it is government, part of it is obviously paperwork and all the things that are very slow, but part of it is also that every time you put you know, you move three feet forward, another disaster brings you five feet back. Hopefully, knock on wood, this is the first, 23 was the first year that we didn't have any disasters and hopefully we're, we're already seeing a speeding in the in the infrastructure development. The other thing is logistics. Um, food insecurity for disasters, in addition to, you know, the, the issues Puerto Rico has with food insecurity overall, we have the highest food insecurity in the nation. Um, I think the largest before us is Mississippi at 17, Puerto Rico's at 31. It's twice the size of the largest state. But besides that, for disaster, food insecurity becomes a national, a, a statewide program problem because people who normally wouldn't have the issue had it. When Maria and Irma hit, it was a double whammy because it did not only affect Puerto Rico's infrastructure, and we're an island, but it also hit our largest shipping ports. So Irma went to Florida and it, you know, it affected Jacksonville and our Miami shipping ports. So it, it got a double whammy. The logistics operation to address during disasters, it's a mitigation effort that still needs to be developed. You know, Because then the food insecurity really becomes an issue of there is no food coming in. And that is something that we're working with with the government on figuring out what are the mitigation efforts and what are the backup plans we need to have. Thank you, Mary Jo. Um, what would you say as we sort of wrap up this question? What What would you say the impacts on uh, food insecurity are today? What does food food insecurity look like uh, in Puerto Rico because of these disasters? Well, definitely, they not you know while. We saw some of the efforts of food insecurity recover because of COVID. Um, it did not match the recovery, the, 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 the down that we have received to in Maria. So 
poverty, food insecurity, inequities that existed during Maria have not gone. Um, I think what Maria did, it did not make it worse, but it opened the lid and it opened our eyes. If insecure urban poverty and urban insecurity is hidden behind cement walls. It lives among us and within us. And there's pockets in the island of deep insecurity that people did not even know existed. So here again, Marina lifted the veil and gave us a very blatant view of what Puerto Ricans, especially in the mountains, live. That's what it really did. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, what a powerful and unfortunate, but powerful realization to, to have to come to. Absolutely. And something important for us all to consider. Um, next, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Rhonda. Um, you work in, in Louisiana and similar to uh, Oklahoma, which has also one in five children um, experiencing food insecurity. Uh, food insecurity is extremely high. Um, Louisiana also, uh, has is one of the most disaster, natural disaster prone communities in the country. Um, so what does this tell us about how economic barriers exacerbate the consequences of natural disaster? What does that look like for y'all? Um, so it looks like many things and it exacerbates, it's, it shows itself um, immediately, right? Immediately you can know at least what time of the month a, a natural disaster happened based on who left in advance of it, right? So if it's at the beginning of the month, folks are likely to have more money, more accessible money if they have any at all. And so they will at least evacuate and go to a different area for safety, for immediate safety. Um, but if it's at the end of the month, say like Hurricane Katrina, which I think happened on the 29th, right? Folks were just not, um, one, we had not seen anything like that before, but also just in terms of having immediate access to funds to move to get gas to get out of town to have a car to um have a hotel space or a, a family or friends to live with when you get to that place that you're not sure how long you're going to be there right and so the immediate impact on the individuals and families um is very definite especially because often folks are depending on the money that's coming in you know from work from from uh, federal resources, from whatever, they're depending on it to come in at the beginning of the month and not so much um, at the end. In terms of long-term implications or longer terms, not even the long-term yet, just that middle piece, right? So let's say the disaster has happened and now we're in the weeks, maybe even months following it, you know, who gets to come back in into the area um, matters, right? It matters because if you are not able to be in those meetings, if you're not able to come to those community meetings, if nobody's lifting up what your voice is and your needs are, then that then folks are making decisions for you, right? And so that exacerbates. And then things are built, policies are happening and being built that will impact you, but you've not had a word in, into it. So advocacy and knowing who to talk to and who's been doing the work along the along the way um, matters. I think in terms of the longer term implications of a disaster, you know, Katrina five, I, I personally with didn't move back home until two years after. I'm not a pioneer, I could not, you know, but I could make that choice for me and my child, right? I wanted her to be a little settled, those kinds of things. A lot of folks don't have that opportunity and that option and so, um, that matters in terms of the public school. The other thing I think we need to remember is that when a disaster hits, you are impacted and affected. And you're also, if you're, a, if you're even a policymaker, right? I had friends during Katrina who would go to meetings, but come back home to gut it out walls, right? And so you're making decisions while you're in the midst of it and there, and you need to. Right, like you can't allow it for anybody else. You need to, and I think folks who are outside of those places um, need to allow those folks who've been in those communities, who've been doing the work, to actually have their voices heard first, foremost, and often. Right, the policy and what the resources are—that's what folks on the other side knows. Right, people on the outside know what resources are available. They know what they have access to, whether they're foundations, whether they're a government entity. They know what resources they have. 
the 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 key to it is to talk to the people who are in need before you decide this is what we're doing. Um, talk to folks and and really hear what their needs are. And they may not know it in the first two weeks, right? I mean, sometimes we have disasters happen and people want to jump in right away and help. And that's fine. But it's also really I, one of the things that struck to me and I was like, oh, I need to do this a little bit differently. Um, it was a hurricane in Louisiana that had happened. I don't know, in the last five years, I, I want to say I want to say maybe it was Delta. Um, but I was talking to a, a, a school food service provider. We had grant funds to offer them. We wanted to help them get things together, get the kids back you know, to meals. Well, this poor lady was sitting in the car trying to answer my questions because that was the only place that she had access to electricity, right? And that she could talk, she could charge her phone in the car and, you know, she's worried about her kids. She's worried about her family. So I was like, wait, hold up, stop. We're not going to do this now. I just need you to know the funds will be available and we'll work this out when you have a moment, right? Sometimes we've got to allow humans to be humans and give them a moment to breathe and to do what they need to do immediately. And I think oftentimes people come in with really good intentions and they want to do really good work and they want to rush, but people who are being impacted sometimes need a moment to breathe. And I think we need to kind of recognize and, and accept that. Yeah, I think that's such an important piece. And it, as you said, it's something that policy often overlooks, right? And policymakers, decision makers. And so the next question is for the entire panel, but I want to start with you, Rhonda, and just sort of follow it up. Um, what are some of those key policy and infrastructure failures that exacerbate food system disruption following a disaster, but specifically in your experience in Louisiana? What does that look like? Um, I think, first of all, it looks like, you know, I feel like a lot of these things we know the answer to, but we don't answer them correctly because we answer them based on political values. We answer them based on perceptions and who we think people are and how they show up. We answer based on, on you know, our own judgments as opposed to answering based on data, based on knowing what works, based on, you know, let's pretend that it happened in maybe another community sometimes and help this community like you would help that community. And so I think in terms of what we can do, a part of it is to really put forth what makes sense and not what makes the news, right? Or not what makes news clippings, not what makes headlines. I think a lot of our, a lot of um, folks do it that way. In terms of the foundations and those folks who come into it, I think sometimes, I, well, one, I can say this, I have definitely seen a change and an improvement in the way folks are people are doing the work. Um, but we also need to make sure that you have a long-term commitment to things and not just um, an immediate because you know you you you, sh you caught me when I fell, but now that I'm you know trying to heal and do all the things, now you're you know you're you're gone and there's a vacuum. So it's almost like I'm I, you know I had the disaster and now I have the second, not necessarily a disaster, but the second time that I'm being impacted and I'm not sure how to where to function now, right? And so I think a part of it is making sure that um, funders and you know folks are there for the long-term um, needs and not just the short-term immediate. Thank you, Rhonda. Dr. Robinson or Mary Jo, are there any other um, policy or infrastructure failures or, or concerns that you wanna talk about before we sort of transition to the next section? Anything that stands out to y'all? I'll go ahead and uh, talk about it more so from an infrastructure program development standpoint. Uh, in addition to what Rhonda said, or more so a compliment to what she said, I think the biggest thing that we need to center is recognizing intersectionality and understanding that we don't know it all, uh, that we don't have the right answers by ourselves, but really embracing that team dynamic to where uh, we listen to the needs of the people who are the most impacted, I think a lot of times when we go to school, we get our education, we have our experience, uh, we can fall into the trap of telling people what they need without, um, or while, while at the same time disregarding what they have to say. And so then because, uh, alluding to what uh, Rhonda had talked about in terms of not being there for the long haul, we oftentimes, we just go ahead and say, oh, this program was a success, but it was a program based on success, based on what metrics? Was it our metrics or was it the metrics by which the people who were most impacted? So I think really 
establishing an alignment and then also being clear on what alignment mean, uh, means to everyone. And then like, um, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, really just having an understanding as to how do we move forward and how do we move forward in a way that is sustainable and not uh, that is just uh, based off of uh, performance and what looks good, what makes media, because then what happens is you have this reoccurring cycle of, you know, all it takes is one little glitch, one little change, and then we're back to square one whenever the next uh, emergency, pandemic, hurricane, tornado, uh, or any sort of disaster hits. I'm hearing a Absolutely, theme, but... yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Betty Jones. <laughs> Absolutely. And if there is anything that I have learned after five years and five disasters, we had hurricanes, earthquakes, COVID, hurricanes, you name it, we had it, um, is that we don't know it all. It is a continuous learning process. And we have changed how we manage disasters with each one of those as we continue to learn. Also within the note, one of the things that I've noticed very different between Maria and Fiona, obviously there's a lot of learning in the process in the meantime, but it's as nonprofits, we have to change what we do and how we think precisely to what Rhonda was mentioning, to understand and hear and listening to the needs of the people that we're serving. Um, especially in a disaster, you think really you don't have time, you, you just want to, right? And instead of saying, here's what you need, you need to ask, how can I help, right? Mm -hmm. And taking our egos, putting our egos away and working together. Maria was an example of not doing that. And we ended up Giving too much, doing too much of one thing and too little of another, and everyone wanted to do any, everything and get you know keep our egos. With Fiona, we found a little bit of a much much stronger cooperation between the government and the nonprofits, the larger nonprofits that deal with disaster management, like the Red Cross and Salvation Army. And we decided, what do you do best? You do that. I'll support you. You support me what I do best. If I, my best is warehousing and logistic and distribution of food, and your best effort is in the last mile distribution of the food and the impact or understanding what the needs are or managing people that are living with diseases and have to you know, have that extra stress during a disaster, um, that was light and day, one thing and another. A lot of it had to do with that. Our own internal egos in, non in the nonprofit world, to be very honest. I mean, it, it sounds resounding from the three of you that, you know, the, the theme that I'm sort of picking out here is that uh, being successful and recovering from these disasters, which aren't going away, um, requires rethinking um, how we work together and how we solve the problem and then recentering the people who are affected by it. Um, and I really love Rhonda, what you said and, and what you thought of Dr. Robinson with about like switching those metrics. It's gotta be the metrics of the people of, of being experienced or experiencing or being affected um, and not necessarily the, the metrics of, of numbers and dollars um, that we are used to working in in so many of our fields. And I think that's just such a powerful takeaway for us to consider. Um, and so while we're, while we're here, I wanna switch it back to you, Dr. Robinson. Um, and get a little bit deeper into your work and the work that you're doing. And so a lot of your work, as you discussed, focuses on health access and uh, nutritional justice. Um, and with your Delta Greens project, you're specifically working in rural communities um, where resources are scarce. Uh, one of the other things we know about uh, rural communities is that hospitals are on the decline, right? Um, and that resources are extremely constrained. And so um, I'm interested, how are these communities made particularly vulnerable when it comes to food security and health? Um, and how does that pertain to natural disasters? So let's start there. Uh, well, one of the things that I thought about well, in thinking through this question was what does emergency mean, right? Uh, I think oftentimes when you have communities that are so impacted by um, food insecurity on a daily basis, those communities are seen as normal, but they're actually not normal. They're actually in a war zone all the time. Uh, and in our case, you know, uh, a lot of times, or in the case of uh, the Mississippi Delta, 
not only are they food insecure, but they're nutrition uh, insecure. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens is, is if a quote unquote disaster comes, then they're even more vulnerable than what they would be on a day-to-day -day basis. But we have to be very careful, no matter what field that we're in, we're, we have to be very careful when we normalize dysfunction. And a lot of times we see that in rural communities, we see that in high impoverished areas and we say, okay, well, that's just normal or that's the way it's always been. But is that really acceptable? It's not. And so what we have to do is we have to really analyze these problems uh, and really look at, okay, we want to have, a, we want to establish a solution, but we don't want to establish a solution to where uh, voices are being disregarded uh, or there may be voices that have more of a say-so in a particular space than others. So it's really finding that balance. Uh, in regard to uh, hospital settings, for instance, uh, we've seen, even with the populations that we're working with, the um, rates of chronic illness, specifically diabetes, obesity, uh, um, heart disease, they are astronomical. And they've been astronomical for a very long time. And so really working to, together with public health professionals, uh, including those on the academic side, uh, those in the hospital setting, and even farmers, right? Because they play a very important part in making sure that they are able to grow the food that is needed uh, for these populations, and then thereby changing the trajectory of chronic illness to chronic wellness. So again, you know, I don't mean to sound redundant, but going back to that intersectionality, I think a lot of times we work, uh, or it's it's very tempting to work in our um, positions in silos, like public health people only talk to public health people, farmers only talk to farmers, but we're really starting to see the very gaps they exist in that intersectionality that we're ignoring. So what we need to do, we need to analyze, okay, where does this profession start? Where does this end? Where does mine begin? And then how can we come to a common thread to where before disaster happens, what are we doing to establish prevention rather than reactive approaches or you know, something that is extreme? Things don't have to be extreme, but we need to make sure that we're monitoring, that we're sur um, surveillancing you know, the happenings now because all, you know, the, uh, and I don't mean to reduce the magnitude of disaster, but basically what disaster does, it tests the system, right? Hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina tested the system at a given point in time. COVID-19 tested the system. So when you test the system and you see the gaps, when things calm down, those are the very, whatever that was broken or whatever fragmentation we saw, those are the very things that we need to focus on when we are in what I would call cooler times. So then when the hot time arises, we'll be ready. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Sorry, I had trouble finding my unmute button there. Um, so you just, you just walked us right into the next question. And so I'm gonna open this question up to the entire panel. Um, but Dr. Robinson, if you wanna start, if you have anything additional to add, um, you, what you talked, what you were talking about seemed to me to talk a lot about resiliency. That's sort of the buzzword, right? Is the resiliency of our systems um, and our ability to continue building back after natural disaster. So I'm just curious, um, what is it going to take in each of your communities to build a resilient food system? And how does that factor into your work? And Dr. Robinson, you set us up perfectly. So if you want to continue, um, I'll start with you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk from the perspective of the Delta Greens project, right? So um, I know that there are maybe a lot of people on this call that are not familiar with the Mississippi Delta. It's a very impoverished area, very rich in history. Uh, and what the Delta Greens project seeks to do uh, is to basically resolve chronic uh, illness in a place that has been exploited psychologically, financially, physically, mentally for a very long time. And so some of the ways that we can go about addressing the issues as it pertains to the project that we're working on is really looking at those infrastructure gaps. Um, what we have found in real time is that we have developed, it, well, in theory, we were going to carry out a project and it was going to go smooth. But then what we saw was that we can't carry out this project until there are certain resources that are set in place. 
in our position, what we have struggled with and what we're currently addressing is the lack of infrastructure that are available to the farmers. Now, the reason why the farmers are key and they are just as important as the patients is because that is our um, hub of expertise when it comes to food source, meaning what, you know, we go to them to ask them, okay, what can you grow, the time that you can grow it, because they help to inform on what sort of pro, uh, produce uh, or produce boxes that we make available to our patients at the Delta Health Center and also those uh, other neighboring uh, clinics in the surrounding areas. And the big thing has been, you know, Doc, we need money and we don't just need money, but we need equipment. But from a, and this is where I'm talking about the, you know, where we depend on each other and we don't have all the answers. By training, I focus on program planning. I pro focus on program evaluation. I'm not a farmer. So it's not just enough for me to understand we need equipment. I need to go to the farmers to say what type of equipment you need. And then what I do, I then go out and I seek out grants. I seek out applications that specifically target or focus on uh, equipment estab establishment uh, for sustainability purposes. And then we work through together how to go about basically using the application or using the grant to say, this is a problem that is going on in the community. We have evidence of this. This is how it needs to go about uh, being fixed. And this is why it needs to be fixed. And then as a result of it being fixed, these are the outcomes that we expect to see. So really just that sort of dependency and looking to see what does success mean for the particular problem at hand? But before we can do that, we all have to be on one accord in understanding what problem actually exists. And there can be multiple problems that exist at one point in time, depending upon who's in the room. Because what I look at as a problem, someone may more or less look at that as not as being a priority problem, especially if they're from a farming infrastructure standpoint. Some people may just say, you know, for example, a farmer, for instance, may say, okay, we need greens. And the reason why I say that is because that has been one topic that has come up in our transcripts and also in our observation, just in conversation, we have this one farmer and he absolutely loves greens. And he's always saying, I need equipment for greens. I need equipment for greens. And I'm like, okay, you know, Farmer John, I hear you. Let me, you know, let me just go back to my team. Let me get the, you know, uh, um, uh, grants and applications in order. And as a matter of fact, we're turning in one of those applications at 5 p.m. today. So my work is cut out for me even after uh, this call. <laughs> yeah, never, no rest for the weary, right? Um, thank you, no. thank you. <laughs> Mary Jo or Rhonda, it, anything you want to add or, or continue on that conversation as we think about what's it going to take to build resilient food systems in your communities? Yeah. Every community has its own situation, right? Well, its own problems. Puerto Rico imports 85% of the food that we consume. So logistics and transportation and that res and building that resilient food system with imported food is critical for the immediate term, right? That's what we're working on right now. But then how do we solve the core issue, which is how do we build internal resiliency of our food systems? Well, one of the very creative projects that we worked with uh, another nonprofit here in Puerto Rico is developing a seed bank. Um, when Maria hit, Agriculture obviously was immediately impacted to the point where uh, farmers tried to re-plant, um, but a lot of the infrastructure was gone. So ended up they ended up having to import some of the seeds, plantains, um, you know, bananas, papaya, poor food in the island. But the food, the seeds that they're importing from like Miami or Brazil are no resistant to the Puerto Rican. Um, environment and the plants die. So one of the things that we're working on is the actually working on a seed bank of locally grown and locally resistant seeds for when emergencies happen, farmers can go in and immediately begin the replanting. It's their economy, not just our food. You know, it's their way of life and we need to support that too. So that's a creative way to start building that resiliency for the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster. That's on our, you know, island, which is obviously different from living in the mainland where you have resources that are a drive away. Um, 
the fact that we are accessible only by water in a natural disaster creates additional barriers that we need to develop internal resiliency. Uh, so when the transportation routes are not accessible or available, we can create our own. That's such a unique way to think about it. And I think it goes back to that same conversation, which is once we get past the immediate disaster, it's identifying those gaps and building towards them so we're ready for the next. And so I think those are both beautiful examples of that resiliency piece. Rhonda, what about you? You know, I, I hope we're not getting ready for the next. Like when you said that, I think I, I got to I have a Sorry about that. I didn't mean to trigger anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. The time to prepare is when you're when nothing's happening, right? Um, and so we also need to look at technology. Are we making sure that the systems that we have, we have so much technology, you know, and things at our fingertips, but do folks know how to use them? Are the systems even able to talk to each other? We literally had to pass a bill in Louisiana so that one um, government agency could talk to the other to get information and access to get kids um, money and funding during, you know, whether it's for EBT or turning on those immediate benefits. If we know you qualify for certain things, then you should automatically qualify for something else. But if the technology won't allow us to get that information, right? And so I think building systems that work when, when things are calm um, is the most, is, is also important. Um, when we talk about um, public-private partnerships, you know, it's come a long way, but now I, I look at USDA as a partner for me, right? And not like, I think initially when I first started this work, it's like, okay, I got to work with USD. Let me see, you know, how this is going to go. But what I found over time was that they actually wanted to be partners with us. They wanted to build things with us. Um, they want to know what's happening so that they can, so that our work can inform the policies. But I think the time to develop those partnerships are during the calm times. And so when things happen, you already know the players, you've built some kind of trust, you know the work, you know what's need it and you're better prepared. Um, I think another piece I would say is to, again, you know, we go back to what do the families need and who are those, like identifying who leaders are in the community in a calm time, in a time when nothing is happening. I think most of the work that we need to do for disasters ha should happen when, there, when nothing is going on. We should just build good systems that work. Um, you know, we know that there are some areas that are more prone to disasters, but if you look at the news now and you see what's happening, anybody can have a natural disaster. Any, a hurricane or a tornado can happen at any moment at any time. And so if we already built in some of those technology infrastructures and some yeah. of those partnerships, then we know what to do when we're in the crisis moment. Yeah, Rhonda, that's spot on. And especially in my experience with Oklahoma, with, with the, out the technology infrastructure in place, it's impossible to respond to a tornado. And I think one of the things I wanted to get into, which we don't have time today, because we've had such a rich discussion, was how did COVID turn things on their head? Because um, that was another disaster we've all just lived through. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big things we identified was that technology. We hadn't spent enough building out our infrastructure ahead of time to respond to this mass shift and how benefits and programs needed to operate. And so um, I don't want to leave us on the disaster piece. Um, since I just accidentally implied that there was going to be another one, which I hope there is not. Um, so, and I want to make sure we have time to get to our, our, our audience Q&A. So I'm going to ask each of you in about 30 seconds or less, um, what makes you hopeful as you're doing this work? And let's leave it on a hopeful note. Who wants to kick us off? I'll kick us off. What makes me hopeful is that I have a ton of advocates that I know are doing really good work, who are committed and they're at the table. I also have friends in the foundation world who are really committed to the work and what's happening and they're doing things. And I've talked to folks in federal government who want it to work, right? And so I think more people are showing up wanting to give, wanting to do good work as opposed to just taking advantage of a situation when it's happening. And so the people make me optimistic all the time. Absolutely. Awesome. Maddie Jo? What makes me hopeful? Um, what makes me hopeful is that one thing great that came out of these horrible situations, it's that I saw our people rise up and take change and, and, and you know, address their issues on with their own hands. 
that makes me hopeful that we're not sitting back waiting for anyone, the government, whoever to come and help us, but we're able to learn how to start ourselves while the help as long as it takes comes. That makes me hopeful. It makes me hopeful that as a nonprofit world, we're starting to work together as a community. That makes me hopeful. It makes me hopeful that we're able to put our egos aside and think of when, who needs us before we think of ourselves. Exactly what Rhonda was talking about, that there's people with us in this, in this work that we do and when we're not alone. And we're building a community of disaster and resilience development that can support each other in moving forward and making change. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Robinson, let you wrap us up on this one. I think what makes me hopeful is knowing that we're not starting from scratch, but we're actually starting from lessons learned. Uh, and so it's all about perspective, you know, on one in one way, you know, depending on the day <laughs> and depending on what's going on, you know, we're like, oh my gosh, another set of issues. But we can actually really use those lessons to help inform on, okay, what didn't work? What did work? How can we develop protocols that are better? Also, even just this very conversation, and I don't mean to sound cliche when I say this, but I have just seen over time how public health conversations have gone from being general to more specific. And I think that a lot of times it's the gaps are found in the specificity of things. Uh, and so when we're having conversations about resiliency, about intersectionality, actually listening to you know people for which programs are designed for, talking about, you know, putting egos aside. These are conversations that 20, 30 years ago, they were not taking place. So even just putting the idea out there and then making this information available to all of the people on this call, because I can honestly say just by hearing from Rhonda, by hearing from Mary Jo, I've learned so much uh, information just from those two individuals alone that will help me to inform or that has, has helped to inform me on how to better approach how I move within my uh, realm of uh, expertise. And so really just knowing that we're not starting from scratch, knowing that we are better than what we were yesterday and really starting to have more honest, more truthful conversations, not to say that we weren't having them before, but I think that we're operating in a time to where beforehand we could ignore the elephant in the room. Now we're coming up to a point to where we are not only saying the elephant needs to be addressed, but this is how the elephant needs to be addressed before it turns into a whole wide circus. So um, <laughs> those are you know, my thoughts on everything. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I love those sort of messages of collaboration, listening and, and working with and lifting up the people actually experiencing it and the resiliency of those communities to answer their, to solve some of their own problems with the right support or to solve their problems with the right support. I think those are all such powerful messages to take away. In the few minutes we have remaining, I wanna ask some audience questions. Um, and I'm gonna direct the first one to Mary Jo. Um, the question is, how does Puerto Rico being a territory, not a state, impact how communities can access federal resources? How many hours do we have? Um, <laughs> well, the most important thing is what we're working really strong in advocacy is in moving from NAP to SNAP. Um, I don't know if you're aware, SNAP is a federal assistance program across the United States for Puerto Rico and a few other jurisdictions um, outside of the 50 states have a different program called Nutritional Assistance Program. You take the S out and it has a big effect. Uh, instead of allotting a amount of money per person based on need, it's a fixed block amount. So that means that it's the same amount of money, no matter how many people need it. And there, obviously that is a direct effect on yeah. receiving and having access to federal assistance program because about half of the people that could participate in SNAP can participate in our program. And those who do get about half of what a person, if I pack my bags and move to Orlando today, I will receive twice as much just by moving. Um, so yes, that's the major Medicare, Medicaid are issues that as a non-state, we we have issues with having assistance to, uh, access to federal programs that affect directly our food insecurity 
equi food equity, and obviously with disaster management, the NAP, the, the disaster SNAP and disaster NAP work differently and that affect directly the speed in which we get federal funds. That was a 30-second answer to a 20-hour discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we probably need a follow up on that, maybe a, another discussion on that, because I think that's really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Um, and it's something that probably a lot of people here uh, are familiar with, the fact that there's Absolutely. different different resource allocations. So thank you, yeah. Mary Jo. Thank you. Um, the last question, we might have one time to sneak in one more question. So, but we'll start with this one. This is to all of y'all. Um, and, and maybe we'll start with Dr. Robinson. How should we evaluate the success or effectiveness of disaster response programs? Y'all mentioned this a little bit in some of y'all's earlier statements, but maybe we'll just wrap it up here. Well, some of the first thoughts that come to mind is that you wanna make sure that you're mixing competence and compassion together. So what I would always say, go to the experts first and see what are some of the metrics that they propose? Like what are some of the basic foundational metrics by which they determine um, a program, especially uh, for instance, a disaster relief program is deemed to be successful. And then from that, you take people from the community and you say, okay, this is what we have developed as a list of successful metrics. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Or based on the list that we have presented to you, what are some additional things that we could add to this list that would help you feel safe in the event that a disaster occurred, and then what sort of responses do would you like to see as a community member? I think that, like I said, what has happened over time is that there has been this sort of agenda that has been pushed forward based on whoever is the dominant voice in the room, but sometimes whoever the dominant voice is, they're just that. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have the necessary right solutions. And when I say a dominant voice, I'm not necessarily talking about an individual in particular, although it could be, but I'm also talking about a dominance in profession, right? We've seen this with public health, quote unquote, versus MD all the time, right? So just really having that balance of voice and looking at uh, our metrics that we've, look, um, we've established before, and then looking at how those metrics performed in real time when the actual disaster occurred. Was this actually a legitimate uh, solution or was this something that needs to be updated? Because times disasters, you know, not to be negative, but disasters will occur. But they may have a different tone depending on what's going on in the world, depending on who's affected. And then, quite frankly, what generation is being affected by that disaster or generations. So we have to make sure that we're just uh, keeping an account of are our metrics up to date and do they reflect collective voice? And I think we've got about a minute left. And so Rhonda, I wanna open it up for you and, and just sort of to end us with, how would you measure or evaluate success and effectiveness in this really complicated work? So I think we have to measure it several times, not just once, right? You can measure the immediate results, but then you can you also need to look like three years out, five years out, like what really happened, you know? And what was bright and shiny and looked like it worked in the beginning, did it actually work? Because sometimes we think, I could think of, you know, in terms of housing or, you know, whether it's the trailers or things that folks get immediately after. And then you look back, you know, which is was good. The system worked, they got what they needed at the moment. But then you find out that there were some health issues that were related to the trailers and those kinds of things. And so I think we can't just measure success or just measure once we need to look several times and over time to see if what we thought worked really actually worked. And if not, how can we learn from it? Yes, can't agree more. And I think that's such a powerful um, place to end as we think about preparing and, and thinking about what success looks like in the long term, one year, five year, 10 years out from a, from a natural disaster, which we're all, you know, all in a place of that right now. Um, and so I just wanna uh, close by thanking uh, Mary Jo, Dr. Robinson and Rhonda for, for joining us. And I think I'm gonna hand it over to Corby Cummer to, to close us out today. So do I, that's the whole idea. Richard, thank you so much for your wonderful moderating skill. 
Um, I'm speaking from the office of the Aspen Institute, where we're in an all-day meeting, starting to choose the third cohort. Richard is in our second cohort of our wonderful Food Leaders Fellowship, and we're grateful to him for moderating. We're especially grateful to Mari Jo, Rhonda, and Vanessa, my colleague at the uh, Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition. It's wonderful to have had you all today in such an interesting conversation. Other food leaders, fellows, and friends have just been emailing me during this to say what a great time they've been having and how interesting and informative this is because our panelists were so impassioned. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll keep the conversation going. We'll be sending out a link to this and our general summary to action soon after today. Please sign up for more. Um, and you'll find it on our website at aspenfood.org, our beautifully redesigned website, the always wonderful Share Our Strength website, strength.org, where our colleagues Elliot Gaskins, Julie McNulty, and Faith Adiola are the most wonderful colleagues and co-hosts anyone could hope for. Um, Richard and our panelists, thank you again to our hundreds of online viewers and more to come in the recording. Thank you for joining us for today.